The views expressed in this podcast are solely those of the podcast host and guest and do not necessarily represent those of our distribution partners, supporting business relationships, or supported audience. Welcome to Transacting Value, where we talk about practical applications for instigating self-worth when dealing with each other and even within ourselves, where we foster a podcast listening experience that lets you hear the power of a value system for managing burnout, establishing boundaries, fostering community, and finding identity. My name is Josh Porthouse. I'm your host, and we are redefining sovereignty of character. This is why values still hold value. This is Transacting Value. How can we expect a little human to grow if they don't have a safe environment to make loads of mistakes within? Because we can't grow without making lots and lots of mistakes and learning from that. Today on Transacting Value, within the scope of all your relationships, how do you handle the guaranteed rupture repair cycle? Whether or not it's your fault, whether or not it's your problem, You're accountable only in so many ways as how you handle the repair. Now, what do you do when you're angry? How do you handle phases of differentiation, developing a conscious effort and self-awareness, and living in the tension? In our conversation with Bronwyn Schweigert, she's back on the show. And without further ado, I'm Porter. I'm your host, and this is Transacting Value. Bronwyn, how you doing? I'm good. Thank you, Porter. I appreciate you coming back on the show, especially in my opinion, so soon. I mean, you basically just left. We were talking about your practice. We were talking about your podcast, Angry at the Right Things, which I hope is going well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Congratulations. And uh, here more recently, you just got done traveling the West Coast, having a good time in the mountains, seeing nature, grounding, I suppose. Uh, But for anybody new to the show, before we get too much into you and I, Let's start with you. Uh, take a couple minutes. Who are you? Where are you from? And you know what sort of things have shaped your perspective? Yeah. So I am a licensed marriage and family therapist in California. And this is my second career. My first career was actually in physical health. I was a nutritionist. My first master's degree is in nutrition. And I myself fell into a very, very, very serious depressive episode where I was barely functioning needed a therapist, you know, so much and couldn't find a good one, even though I went to multiple people. And every time I thought, I think I could do a better job than this person if I were the therapist right now. (laughs) So I went back to school for my second master's in counseling psychology, became a therapist. So I'm kind of, I guess, kind of a populist therapist. And I've learned through, you know, school in part, it gives you some frameworks, but really real life, my own life, especially. And my specialty is anger, because I really see that as the root of all human dysfunction, if we're going to be honest, is how we suppress or I guess the better word that I'm using these days is dissociate from our own anger, because we judge it, we're afraid of it. We think it's shameful. We've learned growing up, it's evil or bad somehow. And we don't see it as it really is, which is like a light on the dashboard of our emotional car saying something's wrong. You need to check under the hood to bring about resolution. And that's what anger wants us to do. It wants us to move towards resolution, not to blow up and become, quote, an angry person, but to channel it out through boundaries, through assertiveness, clarity, and accountability. Okay. So then why do you think anger is usually perceived as a negative emotion? or a problem causer in the workplace, if it's well, actually positive. Like, yeah, well, let's talk about that. So, you know, Josh, you're a parent, yep. I'm a parent. You know, let's be honest. When we have young kids and they're going through their terrible twos, it would be so much nicer if they had zero anger. <laughs> okay. For us, right? For yeah. us, it would be nicer, not for them, yep. but for us. You know, so the terrible twos, for example is a necessary developmental stage where the child is first learning he or she is a different, distinct person than especially his mother, his primary attachment figure. And that's called a phase of differentiation. So in psychology, that's a really like vitally important phase for that child to go through and say no and say mine 
we, we have to collaborate with the child to do that successfully and well. But if we are the kind of parent who believes that this is all bad and that our job is to dominate the child and teach that child, they don't get to say no to us because it's too inconvenient for us or we have just been taught that that child is inherently evil and this differentiation stage is therefore evil and needs to be quashed, then we're going to teach that child implicitly and probably explicitly explicitly that their anger is shameful and bad and evil. And it might start at two and it might continue and it might especially ramp up during the really important differentiation time, which starts around age 10 and goes through, you know, the notorious teenage years, but that child needs to differentiate. They need to successfully differentiate from the parent in order to be healthy. That's not easy for a parent, but it's our job. It's not easy um, for our ego, but it is our job to be the adult and allow them to differentiate from us. And it's our job to take the hit. And we also can do that with boundaries and parameters. We can say, you know, I know you don't like it, but you don't get to say whatever you're saying right now. This is how you can say it more respectfully. So we can help them through it. But if our if our attitude is just to quash it because we feel rejected, because it's painful to our bruised little ego, then we are going to teach that child that the anger is dangerous, it's wrong, it's shameful, and it results in abandonment from the parent. So that child will suppress their anger and they will dissociate for a lifetime. Mm, that's heavy. But so then within which constraints can we do that? Let's say as parents for a, a baseline perspective yeah. to this. Because I feel yeah. like it could be a loaded answer, right? Depending on how many variables you bring into this. But uh, but let's just say as parents, within which constraints? You know what I mean? On one hand of the scale, you've got, uh, what's an approach? Let's sit down and have quiet time and, and talk about our feelings and you know, methodology of, of parenting. And on the other hand, you're going to get spanked and you're going to your room and we'll talk about this when I calm down, you know, type responses. What are the constraints you think that are healthiest to approach some of these outbursts or some of these yeah. styles? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's so easy just to go to the polar extremes. And I find that the healthiest approaches are always in the middle living in the tension where, mm. yes, we're the parent. Yes, we are. But we're also human and they're also human and they also deserve respect. And so it's something like, you know, it's really tailor fitted for each and every situation. So it's something like, hey, Johnny, you know what? I hear that you're angry at mommy. And, you know, I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. It's hard to wait your turn. And it's hard to forego the cookie that you're used to getting. So we can validate his feelings and then say, but you're still not getting the cookie. <laughs> so, you know, in psychology, we learn there's passive parenting, there's authoritarian parenting, but there's this really healthy approach in the middle called authoritative. Mm. Where we're the authority, but we're not authoritarian about it. We're not the dictator where we're like, yeah, Johnny, I get it. You can be angry, but you don't get to say, you know, I hate you, mom. You can say, mom, that makes me mad. So we teach that child how to be a human and we don't shame him for his anger. We validate it. Of course, you're angry. You're used to getting the cookie every day at 6 p.m. And it's hard to change and it's hard to give up things, especially when you don't have any uh, autonomy right now. I have all of it. But we can talk about that. We can give words and language to that and we can validate it. And then we say, but it's still a no. And here's the thing. An hour from now, you're going to get the cookie. So if you can show me some patience, that's going to make mommy really happy and everything's going to work for both of us. Hmm. Okay. So obviously as they grow up then and sort of emulate similar styles or whatever upbringing they had, right? Do you or have you found in your experience so far that preferred style of parenting from one generation to the next tends to stick from that generation to subsequent ones? Or does it shift yeah. and rebound? Well, so what we have learned implicitly as children, usually, you know, that cycle continues when we become parents. Mm -hmm. Unless we like have an awakening where we're like, you know, 
don't think the way I was raised was healthy. I think it really harmed me in a lot of ways and harmed my relationship with anger and myself and brought a lot of shame or what have you. And when we make that conscious effort to learn to do differently, then, you know, that's really it. Otherwise, we're just going to kind of go on autopilot for the most part and find ourselves repeating what we experience, whether we like it or not, unless we do the work. Alrighty, folks, sit tight and we'll be right back on Transacting Value. This message is brought to you by the Armed Forces Vacation Club, a free membership travel hub for active duty military and veterans. The club provides a well-deserved escape during challenging times or post-deployments or for cherished family moments. This exclusive travel club grants access to discounted seven-night resorts and savings on over 600,000 hotels, rental cars, and more. In addition to service members and veterans, the club is tailor-made for National Guard, Reserves, Gold Star families, and civilian DOD employees, as well as their families. The club extends a heartfelt thank you to our military heroes, saying it's time they enjoy a vacation they've truly earned. Discover the world for free at afvclub.com. That's afvclub.com. We're just kind of kind of go on autopilot for the most part and find ourselves repeating what we experience, whether we like it or not, unless we do the work. Yeah, I think in doing the work, sometimes it takes the conscious effort you talked about, but I think sometimes it just happens. You wake up one day and you're like, wow, I was really rude. Or I really need to call somebody and say, dude, my bad. I was hungry yesterday. I hadn't eaten all day or whatever, you know, and, yeah. and try to atone for some of our decisions, whether or not it's in regards to parenting or anything else. But I think developing that, well, developing that conscious effort, that degree of self-awareness, my personal opinion is that's the mark of maturity, not holding everything back, you know, times and places, I think is a justifiable defense to a lot of things too, being Mm -hmm. able to control your responses and whatnot. But that degree of self-awareness where it's all internal and you start to rationalize I think that's the sort of threshold for now you're a mature human being. And I don't know that that's only explicit to adulthood. I think there's some kids that are, wow, you're pretty mature for your age is an expression I've, I've heard um, parents say regularly. Do you think that's more an accurate reference, that self-awareness equating to maturity? Or is it the yeah. times and places and responses outwardly, vice inward? No, I think you're absolutely right. And in fact, you know, I'll tell clients who, you know, let's say they're dating someone and they're really, or they're contemplating, you know, their marriage and if they want to stay married and I'll tell them, you know, the bottom line for hope that you can have is if they are willing to have that self-awareness and that reflection and that introspection, that's, that's the basis for hope. If that relationship is going to be healthy Mm -hmm. moving forward. Okay. Well, so then how do we identify that, you know, within a couple of years of being engaged or getting married from the inception well, of a relationship? Like, how do you say, yeah. oh, okay, you're, you're on it. You figured it out, you know? Or well, that not. only takes like, that only takes a few days, if that. I mean, if you, you know, confront them and they're like, wow, Porter, that's hard for me to hear. I'm going to be honest. But, you know, I think you might be right because... I've been told that before, or I do kind of wonder if I'm, I'm rude sometimes. I do. If you hear that, that humility, that's what we're talking about is humility. Mm. That's what we're really talking about is that posture that it's a heart posture of humility. That's willing to see oneself, to see a reflection of oneself that doesn't feel so good. It's willing to see that reflection and go, okay, yeah, that's true. And I'm willing to see it and I'm willing to work through that. And if someone's not willing, you know, you're, you're the mirror and you're giving them a true reflection and they're like, no, Porter, that's a you problem. You're the reason I'm like this because you make me angry because you, 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 that's not a posture of humility. That's not a posture of willingness to have introspection and self-reflection and be aware and, and really live in reality live in the truth. 
Yeah, but sometimes that feels accurate to say. You know, if you and I are in a relationship and I don't know, I'm being rude or whatever the situation is, and you tell me that it's my fault that something happened, probably because before I came into the picture, you were having a great day, you know? So, I mean, doesn't that accuracy sometimes outweigh the accountability? Oh, okay. So we're, this is like kind of blurry what you're suggesting, but you know, we're all only responsible for our own feelings. Mm. So, you know, that's the most important boundary there is. It's this big invisible boundary where Porter you alone are responsible for your feelings. I am not responsible for your feelings. I'm responsible to you, but never for you. Mm-hmm. And vice versa, I'm responsible for my feelings. You're responsible for my feelings. You're responsible to me, but never for me. So, you know, if I say to you, you just make me so angry and I can't help myself. And that's why I say all these horrible things to you. Mm-hmm. I lose it. I'm not myself. That is a blurring of boundaries. That's a a bypassing of like natural, very real boundaries. I cannot blame my behavior because I alone am responsible for my behavior. You are never responsible for my behavior. You can't be. So I'm trying to blur those boundaries. I'm trying to put that on you when it can never be from you. Never. No one can ever make me do anything. Only I am responsible for my behavior and how I react and respond to my feelings. But me recognizing in this example that I may have instigated those triggers makes me responsible if we were in a relationship, makes me responsible for trying to identify what about my behavior is a trigger to you. I could play that role. So, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's say you, you do say something really hurtful. Mm-hmm. And then I lose it and I just like say horrible things back to you. Like it's a real phenomenon. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So when you say those hurtful things to me, I feel hurt. I feel maybe, of course, angry, maybe betrayed. So those are my feelings, only my feelings and only I am responsible for them. So I have choices over what I do with them. If I'm choosing to be responsible with my feelings, I'm going to use my words because that's what grownups do. That's what mature people do. They use their words. I'm going to say, Porter, you know, when you say that, I don't think you realize how hurtful that is. That's really hurtful. And I just can't listen to that anymore if we're going to hang out together. Like I can't be around that because I don't want to say something I regret. And Mm. I'm about to. So that's how I am responsible for my own feelings is I use my words and I express it. And that's me being assertive with you. I'm not being aggressive. I'm being assertive. But again, so kind of like those extremes I keep talking about and the healthy middle most of us don't know exists. Most people confuse aggressiveness with assertiveness. And so they're passive. They go to the other extreme because they're afraid of being aggressive or they're passive aggressive, right? Right. But really, if we're assertive, that's where we're responsible with our feelings and to the other person. And then you can say, you can, you know, depending on how you feel when you hear me say that, you might feel ashamed. And so you can be responsible with your feeling of shame and say, wow, Bronwyn, I'm really actually ashamed of myself when I hear how much I'm saying hurts you. And and Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that. And that's hard for me to hear. I'm going to take some time and really think about that and get back to you. The reality check moment, I guess. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. So there have been, you said aggression and and I guess passivity uh, and then a middle ground, right? And combinations of any of these aspects. Yeah. For clarity, is aggression primarily qualified by a physical response or outburst in addition to anger? Or how are you... Aggressiveness? Yeah. How are you qualifying aggression in this... Continuum. Yeah. So aggressiveness can just be me attacking you. I mean, that's usually how it is. So there's a term I think is really important to talk about. It's called DARVO. It's an acronym. And it stands for DARVO. Mm -hmm. It stands for deny. This would be the ultimate act of aggression. And this happens like once you learn this concept, you're going to see it probably every day of your life. So unfortunately, Mm. it stands for deny. So let's say you say to me, Bronwyn, 
you know, that's really, it's really hurtful when you say that. So if I'm a grown up, if I'm willing to have that reflection and introspection and willingness to have that posture of humility, when you say that to me, I'm going to say, okay, wow, I'm going to really think about that. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. That's, it's hard to hear. Like I'm fighting shame right now, but I hear you and I respect what you're saying. And I want to take it into consideration and maybe give me some time and I'll think through it and contemplate and get back to you. Hmm. So, but if I'm not willing to do that, then I'm going to probably Darvo you. And this is what most people do, unfortunately. Darvo, it means deny, attack. Okay, and this is aggressiveness. Deny, attack, and then reverse victim and offender. So I might say something like, well, I guess I'm just the worst friend ever. <laughs> so that's a Darvo because I'm, what am I doing? That's like a, that's kind of a funny one. Like you see that in movies and TV a lot, that kind of Darvo, because it's kind of funny. It's, but it is a type of Darvo because what am I doing? If I'm successful when I say that, what have I just done? Now you are comforting me most likely because I've become the victim and you're saying, that's not true, Bronwyn. You're not a horrible friend. So if I'm successful, I'm the victim now. You're comforting and reassuring me. Mm. And I've just derailed the conversation away from your confrontation. That's your the assertion reversal. Yeah. That I'm hurting you. And I've successfully derailed it away from that, which is living in reality. And now we're living in this delusional construct where I'm the victim and you're the offender and you've hurt me. Look at that. Voila. How did I do that so quickly? Alrighty, folks, sit tight and we'll be right back on Transacting Value. Join us for Transacting Value, where we discuss practical applications of personal values every Monday at 9 a.m. on our website, transactingvaluepodcast.com, Wednesdays at 5 p.m. and Sundays at noon on wreathsacrossamerica.org slash radio. And now we're living in this delusional construct where I'm the victim and you're the offender and you've hurt me. Look at that. Voila. How did I do that so quickly? Well, well okay, but... Isn't that sort of subjective then? Like in your example, the two friends, right? Maybe I'm just the worst friend ever. The points you just brought up. Isn't that sort of subjective then? Because you may be party A were offended first and now party B feels offended. But so how is one any more offensive or aggressive? You know what I mean? No, it, it, yeah. But see, so you're getting lost in the algorithm here. Yeah. The point is your feelings were hurt by something I said. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to deny, I'm trying to move away from, and that's manipulative. Like a deflection. Yes. Uh -huh. So it's always about the original person. So what I would encourage you to do as that original person is say, okay, I fear that you don't want to talk about what I just brought up. It sounds like that's really hard for you to admit, Bronwyn, that what you are saying is hurtful. It sounds like you really don't want to talk about it right now, Bronwyn. Is that right? So I would just go right to the heart of it. Double down. Cut right through the BS and just stay there. Mm. Stay there, stay there, stay there. Don't let that person manipulate you away from reality. You know, it's... Stay in reality. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, that's easier said than done sometimes. The uh, interesting point, an interesting point that you just brought up so for anybody new to the show, most of my career has been in the Marine Corps infantry. And up until a few months ago, I got my real estate license in Florida. And so now in doing that, one of the things that you just sort of tipped off in my head, this may not be a foreign concept to a lot of people, but in case it is, I'll break it down in a couple seconds. There's a comparative market assessment that realtors can do basically to determine a more accurate price valuation for a property. Buyers, sellers, doesn't matter, but for any particular property, sort of like what you might see on Zillow as a, a as estimate or, or whatever, right? Where that may focus on objective uh, data and number crunching. And then a realtor can come in and say, okay, yeah, but what's not factored in there is the fact that nobody actually walks to that school. Everybody drives because there's no sidewalks. And so the fact that it's close to a school, that estimate says it's higher when really, actually, it doesn't add any value to that property. And so we can tweak it more, wow. more accurately, right? My point being yeah. is that in learning that process, especially for new realtors to 
or even new brokers in some states to be able to say, okay, I need to focus on the subject property, the one originating property that I started trying to value. And then I pull in comparable properties to say, well, this uh, original one, the subject property has three bedrooms and the comparable one has four. So the value of an additional bedroom in that neighborhood is X amount. I'll subtract it from that comparable sold property. And then over a few comparable properties, this is the average price point for our subject property, right? And you start taking it one variable at a time. What's easy to do is get distracted by these other properties and these other qualifiers within these properties and attributes within these properties that you lose sight of the subject one and it becomes this new equation altogether because it's easy to get, you know, to lose focus. Right. I was, I've never actually balanced out in my head until just now with everybody listening, apparently in public that what you're talking about emotionally actually had some resonance with property values, but I thought that was interesting just to share with you in concept. And so now saying all those things though, right? Trying to keep focus. You brought up parenting earlier, so not to harp on it, Hmm. but to retrace for a second. That's, that's easy to do and almost devalue a two-year-old's perspective, even though they're the originating party saying, you don't talk to me like that. Uh, you know the, you know the video yeah. on social? No, Linda, you listen. The little kid, have you seen yeah. those videos? Oh, well, yeah. anyway. Yeah. He, he <laughs> says, you listen to me or the mom. She says, you listen to me. And he says, no, Linda, you listen. And it goes, oh, yeah. it goes back and forth. Right. And so what about then? Because you can't give too much credibility because they're learning boundaries and parameters and responses. Well, I haven't, I haven't, seen that video, but I can't imagine that little boy didn't learn that from, he's emulating his father right now. I'm pretty sure. Um, he's, he learned that from somebody, his father and he's yeah. probably, probably his father. Anyway, um, you know, that's not going to happen for the most part, for most of us, hopefully that level of antagonism from a small child. But I will say, so here's the thing. If we're going back to the posture of our heart and the humility, you know, as a parent, my child has intrinsic value and worth. And you can say you love your child to your blue in the face, but unless you're actually loving that child with your action, that means mm. nothing to them. And when we learn to validate their feelings, again, we don't have to give them what they want to validate their feelings. We can say, you know what? You are angry at mommy and that's okay. I don't blame you, but this is what's going to happen. So when we do that, though, what we're doing implicitly is we're teaching them that they matter because when their feelings matter to us, they learn that they matter to us. If we don't do that, they learn they don't matter to us. Now, we might say, Johnny, you matter to me. I love you. That means nothing. When we show them that their feelings matter to us, then they learn they matter and they become a powerful child and they become a child with the ego strength to walk away from the abusive boss, the abusive partner Mm. later in life. They do because they learned at a very young age that they matter and that they're not going to lose that. So that's really crucial. However, none of us are going to do that perfectly as parents, none of us. And that's okay. Because what children need is a good enough parent. In fact, they don't need a perfect parent. That would actually be um, unfortunate if we somehow figured out how to be a perfect parent. Because what kids need from us, okay, again, modeling is 99.999% of what they learn from us. We can say, hey, Johnny, this is how you do things in the world. That means nothing. That has no traction. When we model through our interaction with them, that's where their brains are just absorbing. And that's what they're going to naturally repeat on autopilot, Mm. you know, on their own. So when we make a mistake, when we have that reflection, that self-awareness, when we wake up the next morning and go, oh my God, I blew it with Johnny. When we come to them and we say, Johnny, I just want to apologize because yesterday daddy got really mad and he overreacted. And you know what? It wasn't wrong for him to be mad, but it was wrong how he reacted. That was wrong. And what he said was wrong. And you know what? Daddy wants to apologize because he was not responsible 
for his anger in that moment. And he wants to win back your trust now. And so I'm going to, I'm committed to doing that by, you know, next time I'm angry, I'm going to show you that I can be responsible with my anger. And, you know, I don't blame you for being angry at me right now. That's okay too. It's okay for you to be angry. That's what we call in the psychological world, a repair. We call this rupture repair. So all relationships, especially with our children, have rupture. They're all going to have ruptures. Like good luck avoiding a rupture. But what matters isn't avoiding a rupture. What matters is having a good repair after a rupture because studies show that a good repair in a relationship, meaning a good apology, a good ownership of what happened, an apology, a commitment to winning back that person's trust and changing, that actually builds trust and it teaches, especially the child, that, you know what, relationships are where we make mistakes, but they're also where we repair. And this is how we repair. We just admit it. We own it. And, you know, mistakes are not shameful. They're not shameful. That's what little Johnny learns, that all humans make mistakes. They're not shameful. This is what you do when you make a mistake because the other person matters. You matter. Everyone matters. And they learn trust. They learn to respect that parent. And they learn like, oh, this is a safe relationship for me to make mistakes in too. And you know, how can we expect a little human to grow if they don't have a safe environment to make loads of mistakes within? Because we can't grow without making lots and lots of mistakes and learning from them. So we're creating a safe environment for that to happen. This is the key to good parenting, isn't doing it perfectly, isn't even modeling it perfectly, but modeling what being a healthy, whole human who is in a state of growth always. We all are. That what that looks like. All righty, folks, sit tight. We'll be right back on Transacting Value. This message is from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. VA disability compensation is a monthly tax-free payment to veterans who got sick or injured in the military and to veterans whose service worsened an existing condition. You may qualify for VA disability compensation for physical and mental health conditions that developed or worsened due to service. Learn more at va.gov slash disability. This is the key to good parenting, isn't doing it perfectly, isn't even modeling it perfectly, but modeling what being a healthy, whole human who is in a state of growth always, we all are, that what that looks like. I mean, I guess in a way, that's sort of the point of perfection or maybe the uh, point of efficiency. I'm, I'm not sure what the qualifier here is, but to be able to create an environment with enough controls in place for future or in some cases, previous generations, let alone ourselves, to be able to experience as many different causalities, I guess, as possible and learn how to respond to them and just experientially learn, I think. I was talking to my brother earlier this morning, actually. We were talking about gaming, uh, video gaming and tabletop, or, or I guess digital and tabletop. And that was one of the points he brought up. In fact, here on the show, we had a guy named Porrick come on from Nightwatch Games down in San Antonio, Texas. And it's a board game store tabletop game store. And the two of them echoed a similar sentiment where the aspect of games that they find so alluring and appealing, a specific tabletop in this example, that they find so alluring and appealing is that you can experience a wide range of human emotions and responses and conflicts and resolutions and controls and value systems with minimal degrees of repercussion in the real world because it's in a game. It's a construed environment, but it's all the same situational circumstances and relationships with other characters in these role-playing games. And then what the uh, results of your decisions happen to be. And so it gives you controls. And I think to macro that and zoom out a little bit to the parenting angle you just brought up, I think maybe that is the, you know, maybe perfection point of parenting to be able to recreate those opportunities for our kids. And if we can do that effectively without losing ourselves in the character then maybe we're doing a pretty good job. And I think that's the tricky point, trying to do that and figure out how to do that 
and teach effectively in ways that these little people are able to understand, not in language, not in processing, but as individuals and come around to that. I, I really have one other question in terms of this context for you, and then I'll, I'll close this out for the sake of time. But you mentioned briefly the negative boss, and I'm curious in a workplace because I worked with a guy at one point and I said, look, man, this opportunity means so much to me. I left 20 minutes early and I thought for sure I was going to make it on time, but I hit traffic and now, you know, I ended up being 10 minutes late. Sorry. And his response was, well, I really need you to start showing up on time or this isn't going to work out. And in the moment I was offended because I said, man, I just put it out there on the table and told you this means something to me. And now you're shooting me down. But after we spoke a few days later and I realized his position, he was brand new. And so he said, well, I didn't know how else to respond. Like anybody else, you were late. So my baseline was a late employee, not somebody trying to make an effort and circumstantially was late. Well, he, you guys didn't know each other mm-hmm. and there was no trust. No. There was zero trust foundation. Yeah, that yeah. was the first meeting. Yeah. And so what about in those circumstances? This is, like I said, my last sort of contextual question here, but how do you recommend we approach those to be able to become a stepping stone for establishing some rapport and, you know, in a more mature, not parent to child relationship, but in a workplace when somebody's angry or when we're both angry because it's a misunderstanding, how do we approach that? Yeah. Well, I mean, his response, I can see why, you know, it's more justifiable because he was brand new himself and, Mm -hmm. you know, it sounds like he has some anxiety and he didn't know you Mm -hmm. and you didn't know him, but if you worked with him for six months or even, you know, three months and you were a trustworthy employee, that would be a horrible response on his end. Because what he did is he completely dismissed what you said. Like yeah. he completely ignored what you were saying. That's what it felt like. Yeah. He did. Yeah. That's just so dismissive. And in that case, I would say, Hey boss, you know, you know me and I know you. And you're completely dismissing what I'm saying right now. And that's not okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah, we ended up working through it similarly, not the same words, but similarly, uh, and came to an understanding that maybe we both overreacted from stress that day. But yeah, interesting. Okay, I just want to get your take on it. So my my final question, uh, which I've been plugging into uh, all of these conversations for anybody who's new to the show But I'm curious, Bronwyn, in your own experiences uh, over whatever length of time you want to attribute this to in your life, everything that we've talked about and all of these experiences that you brought into this conversation, how have these lessons actually helped you develop a sense of self-awareness, maybe even self-worth? Well, have the lessons that I, what I talk about. That we talked um, about this conversation. Yeah. Like, you know, patience and tolerance and, and, and honesty and Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's funny because you had said just now a couple minutes ago, like it's hard to get to that place with a child as a parent. Well, yeah, it's hard to get to that place because life is a learn by doing process. I don't know that we ever get to that place. There's no like arriving at maturity. It's a constant learning and growing process. And how do we do that? We make lots of mistakes. And so having that, you know, I talked about a posture of humility, but also like that mindset, that understanding that, you know, I'm human and that's how humans work. We're not little robots. We're humans and I'm going to make lots of mistakes and that's okay. And I really see the, the enemy to humanity, to living out a full human and mature existence is shame because shame mm. does not allow us to be human. Decimates. It just doesn't. Yeah. It decimates. So we don't have time to get into it. But I, you know, I struggled with a lifetime of shame and um, it very much affected me in, in so many ways. And one day I had kind of my own epiphany where I realized, you know, I got my shame that I could see in retrospect through my father. And I was actually going for a run when it all came to me. I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but it just like popped in my brain. Oh, at dinner every night growing up, that's where my dad put his shame onto me. And so while I was running, I think I was like stopped at a stoplight. And I just did this little imagination exercise in my head where I just pictured young Bronwyn giving him back his shame. Mm. 
Mm. Putting it all in a big cardboard box and just going, here you go. Return to owner. It's not mine. It's yours. Do what you want with it, but it's your shame. And I just gave it back to him. And from that day, that was just like three years ago. You know, if you were to email me later today and, and say, hey, Bruno, I need to talk to you about something. In the past, I would have been like, oh my God, what did I do? I mean, that would have been my default. And since that exercise that I did for myself, I go, okay, Porter needs to talk to me. I just, it's like my baseline has changed. It was like the shame was like in my gut and it's gone. Mm. And I'm like more allowed to be human. I'm like completely allowed to be human. And so now when I do make a mistake, which I do, of course I do. I'm able to just go, okay, I made a mistake. I need to do X, Y, and Z now. And I feel free. And so I talk about this and I actually walk through with my listeners on my podcast, how to do this exercise for themselves. But um, really it's about getting rid of this shame because shame is rooted in a lie. It's rooted in a distortion. Mm. And, and we talk about coming back to living in reality. We need to get rid of the distortions in order for us to live a whole life which is rooted in truth and rooted in reality. Yeah. And given enough time, you'll get physically sick if you don't, yes. or if it, you know, burrows deep enough. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. Um, Bronwyn, do you, I guess, have any uh, resources, any recommendations, any place people could go if they want to get in touch with you, obviously to listen to your podcast, angry at the right things. Yeah. What do you recommend? Where do people go? Yeah. So listen to my podcast and then I have a Facebook, um, angry at the right things, Facebook page too. Okay. And your podcast, I assume is on most, uh, or all streaming platforms. It's on everything. You find it? Yeah. Okay. Wherever you find your podcast. Yeah. Sweet. All right. So for anybody who's new to the show, depending on the player you're streaming this conversation, you can click see more, you can click show more, uh, underneath the player. And in that drop down of text, you'll be able to see links to get you to Bronwyn's show and obviously your Facebook as well. So you can reach out to her you find out examples of these exercises and obviously all of the cool conversations that you're having with listeners and journeys you're bringing them on to learn how to be obviously angry at the right things. I appreciate your time. I appreciate this opportunity. You coming back on the show, especially after your trip, unwinding, trying to get back into a routine. And now you're like, you know what? I'm going to sit here and talk about value systems. So I, I appreciate your recharge, uh, but your authenticity and your willingness to come on and talk. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Porter. It was fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. My pleasure. And to everybody who tuned in on the show, thank you guys for listening. Continuing listeners coming back, new listeners joining us for the first time. Check out all of our other conversations at transactingvaluepodcast.com. If you guys want to be on the show, thank if you you've got partners, insights that you folks, want to contribute to the show, for there's a voicemail button you can click on our website or you can together. send an email to transactingvaluepodcasts at or even to contribute sdytmedia.com and to let us know what you think of the show please leave a review on our website, transactingvaluepodcast.com. We also stream new episodes every Monday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time through all of your favorite podcasting platforms like Spotify, iHeart, and TuneIn. You can now hear Transacting Value on Reads Across America Radio Eastern Standard Time, Wednesdays at 5 p.m., Sundays at noon, and Thursdays at 1 a.m. Head to readsacrossamerica.org slash transactingvalue to sponsor a wreath and remember, honor, and teach the value of freedom for future generations. On behalf of our team and our global ambassadors, as you all strive to establish clarity and purpose, ensure social tranquility, and secure the blessings of liberty or individual sovereignty of character for yourselves and your posterity, we will continue instigating self-worth and we'll meet you there. Until next time, that was Transacting Value.